Approaches in Biopsychology for Year 1 Psychology. So that is for your AS examination. So what do you need to know for the approaches section? So you need to be aware of the origins of psychology and the four main approaches for this year. So that is behaviourist, social learning theory, cognitive approach and the biological approach. Origins of psychology. So introspection was when psychology started to emerge and it was developed by Wilhelm Wundt and he was the first person to call himself a psychologist. He believed that the human mind could be studied scientifically and developed the technique of introspection. This is when a person looks into their own processes to gain knowledge about their mental and emotional states. So he believed that with appropriate training, these processes could be observed systematically. And this systematic method is where psychology started to become more scientific. So usually participants were presented with a stimulus, for example, a visual image, and they were asked to describe their inner thought processes towards that image. Uh, Wundt would then uh, compare these responses to generate theories and perception. Psychology as a science then, so empiricists believed that knowledge comes from observation and experience and this is where Wundt started to emerge psychology as a science because it was based on observations. It was based on two assumptions. Firstly, that all behaviour has a cause, so there is a cause for our behaviour, and then the ability to predict the behaviour. So once we know the cause of the behaviour, we should be able to predict how people would behave in different situations. And this becomes later known as the scientific method. The scientific method refers to the use of investigations that are objective, they are systematic and they are reliable. So we should be objective in our collection, so it shouldn't be based on any any opinion, it should be fact-based, it should be systematic and it should be replicable. So we should be able to repeat our observations and our methods at future dates. So is it? So generally, psychology does use objective and systematic methods of observation to gain um, findings. Because scientific methods are relied on, it, we are our able to establish a cause of behaviour through the methods and we are able to believe that we can predict behaviour. However, some psychological research does lack objectivity. So this can lead to problems with experimental bias, demand characteristics which may reduce the validity of our research and how we are able to apply our findings. Also, some have argued that just using the scientific method is just dressing up psychology. Psychologists may be using technical language of science, but they are not engaged in real scientific research. The behavioural approach then. So this um, rejected the vagueness of introspection and it wanted to uh, focus on observable behaviour, not the internal mental processes. It maintains more control and objectivity because we rely generally on lab experiments and they believed that the processes of learning is the same for all species. So we learn through association and reinforcement and the use of non-human animals to study this. So classical conditioning, that is uh, learning through association. So remember the word classical has ass in it and association starts with as so classical is association so before conditioning we have a neutral stimulus that produces no response we have an unconditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response now during conditioning these two become associated they are paired together so the neutral stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus and it is with enough pairings that the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus and produces the conditioned response. So this was first developed through or recognised through Pavlov. So we'll look at his research. So he found that before conditioning, food was a neutral stim um, 
was the unconditioned stimulus, sorry, that produced the unconditioned response of salivation. So when the dog saw food, they salivated. The bell was the neutral stimulus. It produced no response from the dog. So during classical conditioning, so during conditioning, the bell and the food were paired together. Okay. Then after conditioning, the bell alone, which became the condition stimulus, produced the condition response of salivation. So just hearing the bell by itself was enough for the dog to produce their conditioned response. Operant conditioning is learning from reinforcement or punishment, so our consequences. Reinforcement means that a behaviour will be more likely to be repeated. Punishment will cause a behaviour to be less likely to be repeated. Positive reinforcement is when a behaviour produces a consequence that is pleasant for us. So if we do well on a test, we are rewarded, therefore we are more likely to repeat that behaviour, so we will be more likely to try and do well in a future test because we associate it with gaining a reward. We, we realise that we'll gain a reward if we do well. Negative reinforcement is when we remove an unpleasant stimulus. So we're, we're gaining a reward from the removal of an unpleasant stimulus. So for example, when we hear our alarm clock, it is a very unpleasant sound. We hit the snooze button and it removes that unpleasant sound. Therefore, we are reinforced for that behaviour. So we're more likely to press the snooze button the next time we hear our, sa uh, our alarm going off. Punishment is giving an unpleasant consequence to a behaviour. Therefore, the behaviour is less likely to be repeated in the future. So Skinner did some research in this. He developed a special cage that he referred to as a Skinner box and he used rats. So in one experiment, the rats were in the cage and they moved around freely and when it accidentally pressed a lever, a food pellet was dropped. So then the rat learnt to press the lever in order to gain food. So that was positive reinforcement. They pressed the lever, they were rewarded for that behaviour by the food, therefore they repeated the behaviour. In another uh, experiment, the rat was placed in the box and there was an unpleasant electric shock running underneath. So the rat would move around, they accidentally pressed the lever and the shock, the current would stop. So they'd stop having that unpleasant stimulus. Therefore they learnt to press the lever to remove the unpleasant stimulus. The negative reinforcement there, so that's negative reinforcement. So the strengths of the behavioural approach is that it has real life applications. So operant conditioning can be used during token economy. So token economy is a form of um, treatment in managing lots of different behaviours. So in prisons and psychiatric wards. So. For example, in schizophrenia, if a person displays behaviour that isn't schizophrenic, they are rewarded with tokens that can be then exchanged for privileges. So, as we can see, operant conditioning is being used there. Scientific credibility. So, generally, the behavioural approach used the scientific me method. It was very rigorous in its objective and replication. So, it gives the behavioural approach credibility and status. There are some ethical issues in particular with Skinner's research. So they were exposed to stressful conditions, um, so that might affect how they actually behaved, so is it really that valid? It has environmental determinism, so remember determinism means that we aren't control of our own behaviour. Okay, Our behaviour is a result of something. An environmental Environmental determinism means that our behaviour is determined by our past experiences that have been conditioned. So it says that free will, our ability to control our behaviour, is just an illusion. Also the use of non-human animals, so it uses dogs and rats, it doesn't really tell us that much about our own human behaviour. So we need to be cautious when generalising these findings to humans due to humans having higher thinking brains and far more complex behaviour than that of animals. 
social learning theory, this um, extends on the behavioural approach. So behavioural and social learning theory are part of a broader spectrum of learning theory. So if in the exam you get a question of outline and evaluate learning theory, you can talk about both behavioural approach and social learning theory. If you get a question in the exam that's purely outline and evaluate learning theory, then you, obviously you only talk about this. If you get a question that's um, outline and evaluate the behavioural approach, then you only talk about classical and operant conditioning. So learning theory is still based on the idea of reinforcement, but we learn our behaviour through observation of others and we imitate that behaviour, we copy that behaviour. And it happens through indirect re reinforcement. So we aren't personally reinforced for that behaviour. It happens through something called vicarious reinforcement. So we see someone else being rewarded, reinforced for their behaviour and it motivates us to imitate their behaviour. So there are four meditational or cognitive processes. Remember the acronym of ARM. So attention, we need to have noticed and observed the behaviour in the first place in order to copy it. Retention, we needed to have remembered that behaviour. Our motor reproduction, so we need to have the skills to be able to replicate or perform that behaviour. And finally, we need to be motivated to copy that behaviour. So if we've seen a person being rewarded for that behaviour, we're more likely to copy it. And if we've seen that they've been punished, we're less likely to copy that behaviour ourselves. Identification is a key factor of social learning theory. So we're more likely to copy the behaviour of people we identify with, especially if they are role models, so someone we look up to, if they are attractive or have a high status. So that's why people are more likely to copy or imitate celebrities. Or if they are similar to ourselves, so in age or gender. So a key research that you need to be aware of is Bandura's research. So his aims was to see if children would imitate aggression modelled by an adult. The procedure was 36 girls and 36 boys aged between three and six years were divided in two different groups. One group saw an adult model show aggression towards the Bobo doll. The second group observed non-aggressive behaviour, so the adult was setting up toys, and the third group were the control group. They didn't see any model. The first two groups, um, some observed the same sex model and some watched opposite sex models. Okay, so this links into the idea of do we are we more likely to imitate the behaviour of people that we identify with. The children who had observed the aggressive models were significantly more aggressive. Okay, suggesting that they had learned that behaviour. A third of the children who had observed the aggressive role models repeated that behaviour. None of the children who observed the non-aggressive models behaved verbally aggressive. So children showed signs of observational learning and children were more likely to imitate the same sex adult, so supporting the idea of identification. So social learning theory does have useful applications. So for example, it can help us understand criminal behaviour. It might also help us to understand eating disorders. So for example, people might be more likely to copy um, female celebrities who are thin because they are admired and they're seen to be rewarded for that behaviour. It can explain cultural differences. So again, linking to eating disorders, it can explain why in Western cultures there is higher rates of um, eating disorders than in non-Western cultures. So it might explain why some behaviours aren't universal. It's less deterministic than behaviourism, so it suggests that we do have some control over our behaviour. So we do have the ability to choose whether we imitate our behaviour or not. So it says, yes, we have some free will. However, generally in research it is lab based. So therefore there are, um, it reduces the ecological validity. In particular, 
with um, Bandura's research, there were demand characteristics. So some of the children were noted in hearing or saying, there's the doll that we're meant to hit. Okay, so the doll was designed to bounce back up, encouraging student uh, children to be more likely to attack the doll. So children could have behaved how they're expected to. Also, Bandura's research ignores the role of biology and behaviour. So differences in aggression between boys and girls could have been down to the testosterone levels. So boys have more testosterone. That could have explained why they were more aggressive than girls. So it ignores the biological approach. Remember, we can always compare with another approach. So the cognitive approach. So this says that uh, processes should and can be studied scientifically and generally in lab experiments. The mind is like a computer and information received from our senses is processed by, the, by our brain and is processing directs the way that we behave. So we have to infer what people are thinking within the cognitive approach. So inference is a key part of the cognitive approach. Schemas are little packets of information that help us make a shortcut. They help us to um, organise and interpret information and they are based on our previous experiences. So for example, if I grew up seeing that all swans are white, I would have a schema that all swans are white. However, they develop and evolve with experience. So then I walk around and I see a black swan and I have to re-evaluate my schema. I have to adapt it because I realise that all swans aren't white swans are black and white. So we have two types of models that you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of theoretical models. So this is information processing approach that so says that information throw, flows through a system in stages. So there is an input, there is a storage and there's retrieval. So think back to the multi-store model. We have information being input, there is a store, so whether it's our sensory store, our short-term cell, or a long term still, and then it is retrieved. The computer model is where the mind is compared to the computer, suggesting there are similarities in the way information is processed. So the brain is referred to as a central processing unit. Uh, turning information is the idea of coding and that we have stores to hold information. So the emergence of cognitive neuroscience, so this is a scientific study of the biological structures of our brain. So certain structures in our brain underpin cognitive processes. So the way that they study the brain is through the use of brain imaging. So for example, PET scans and fMRI scans. And it has allowed us to locate different parts of the brain that are involved in different processes. So think back to memory, uh, we found that episodic and procedural memories were recalled from the prefrontal cortex, whereas our semantic memories were recalled from our basal ganglia. Also think back to OCD, we learnt that um, abnormalities within the basal ganglia meant that people were more likely to suffer from OCD. Uh, strengths of the cognitive approach is the use of the experimental method. So it's very experimental and scientific in its use of methods. Okay, so it's rigorous in collecting and evaluating evidence. So that increases the internal reliability and validity of the research. It has very useful applications. So it's been useful in treating people with uh, illnesses such as depression, OCD, schizophrenia, with CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy. This means that people are more likely to be able to go out to work afterwards, um, have less time off from work, they're able to contribute to uh, the economy, showing the importance of scientific research and psychological research within our society. However, it only says that these processes take place. It doesn't tell us why they take place. It doesn't pay much attention to the role of emotion or motivation, it's ignored. Um, many studies tend to be very artificial, so think back to our memory topic, that was cognitive based, use of a uh, learning list of words, very artificial, very use of um, unnatural stimulus. 
so it lacks ecological validity. Also, the computer model doesn't successfully explain human coding. Um, computers very rarely make a mistake, whereas the human mind is quite often making mistakes. Also remember, compare it to another approach. This approach is uh, disregarding any um, observations of behaviour. So we might develop OCD due to observing someone doing it. Not that we have a thought process, information process happening. The biological approach. So this assumes that everything that is psychological firstly starts as being biological. So we look at our structures and processes within the body. So genes, neurochemistry, so our brain structure and neurotransmitters. And by understanding these, it can explain our thoughts and behaviours. So genes can influence us in a number of ways. So the idea is that our genes uh, carry our genetic information and instructions and just in the same way that our physical characteristics are inherited. Our genes can influence our personality, our intelligence and certain abilities. You need to be aware of what a genotype is. So a genotype is the genetic code. That is our written DNA whereas our phenotype is the ways in which our genes are expressed through physical, behavioural and psychological characteristics. So for example, I could have the gene for uh, blonde hair, but I have it dyed brown, that is my phenotype. I could have two identical twins, um, one has moved to the city, eats quite a lot of fast food, does little exercise, one has stayed in a rural area, likes to go for long walks, eats quite healthily. Now their phenotype will be quite different. One you'd expect to have a body shape that is relatively maybe larger than the other, might be a bit overweight, might not be as healthy as the other twin. Whereas the twin that eats relatively healthy and goes on long walks will be, their phenotype might have be a thinner body structure. Our biological structures can influence us in different ways. So the nervous system carries messages from one part of the body to the other. And a lot of our behavior is controlled by the nervous system. So our breathing, eating and sexual behavior. The brain, again, controls different aspects of our behavior. In particular, there are different parts of the brain that specialize in different functions, different tasks. So for example, our cerebral cortex is generally associated with our higher order functions such as our thought and language. Neurochemistry can influence us in different ways. So that re refers to our neurotransmitters and our hormones. So neurotransmitters are chemicals that tr transmit signals and they can influence our behavior in different ways. So for example, low levels of serotonin are linked to OCD and depression, whereas high levels of dopamine are associated with schizophrenia. Hormones, hormones cause a psychological reaction in a target cells, which in turn influences behaviour. So, for example, high levels of testosterone is thought to have a relationship with aggression. So, high levels are thought to be linked to high aggression levels. Also, you need to know about evolution. So, this is the gradual change of inherited characteristics of a species over a generation. So survival of the fifth fittest, so they, those that are best adapted to the environment. And because they are best adapted to the environment, that increases their likelihood of survival, which in turn increases their reproductive success. So any of these traits that allow an individual to survive and to reproduce are passed on to future generation and offsprings. The biological approach is extremely scientific. It is objective we are able to replicate research studies under the same condition. It has led to real world applications. So this research into neurotransmitters and mental health disorders can help create treatments. So for example, the development of uh, SSRIs for OCD and antipsychotics for schizophrenia. It's extremely reductionist in terms of it's biologically reductionist. It breaks down the complex behavior of schizophrenia down to the uh, single components of dopamine. 
high levels of dopamine are linked to schizophrenia it completely ignores any other influences around us we can't generally establish causal relationships or conclusions just because there is an association between two factors so for example i found that there is a link there is an association between low levels of serotonin and ocd doesn't mean that ocd is caused by having low levels of serotonin also we can't uh, separate nature and nurture in particular in the use of twin studies and family studies yes they all have genetic similarities but also they share the same environment so it could be that it is down to nurture rather than nature it could be that they all have learnt the same behavior so for the biopsychology then you need to know about the nervous system neurons endocrine system and fight or flight so the nervous system is broken down into two key branches this is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system so the central nervous system is broken down further into the brain and spinal cord. So the brain is the centre of our conscious awareness. And it is thought to, it is our cerebral cortex, which is thought to distinguish us between um, animals, so we have higher functioning skills. Our spinal cord is an extension of our brain and it passes information from the central nervous system to the nerves in our peripheral nervous system however sometimes it will bypass the brain in particular in a reflex reaction okay so if we touch something very hot we will have an automatic response of to remove our hand so it's a reflex reaction from that so the peripheral nervous system is the other main branch of the human nervous system and that is broken down into somatic and autonomic. So somatic is our voluntary behaviour. So muscle movements that we are in control of. Our autonomic is our involuntary behaviour. So our breathing, heart rate, digestion and this is further divided down into the sympathetic branch which is responsible for our fight or flight response and our parasympathetic branch which returns our body back to normal we'll look at fight or flight in a little bit more detail further on so our sympathetic gets us ready for fight or flight so it increases things like our heart rate our breathing rate whereas the parasympathetic branch will return our body back to a normal state after the stressful situation our endocrine system then is a network of both hormones and glands that affect behaviour. So endocrine glands produce and secrete hormones that uh, are carried through our bloodstream and move to targeted cells within the body or organs. So the pituitary gland is an example of, the en of an endocrine gland and it produces hormones which influ influence the release of other hormones from other glands. Okay, so that's why it's often referred to as the master gland. So it's divided into two parts. You have an anterior and a posterior. So the anterior pituitary gland releases something referred to as ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, and it's a response to stress, which it stimulates the adrenal cortex to re release cortisol. Adrenal glands are another type of endocrine glands and they are located just above our kidneys and they're made up of two parts. You have the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Adrenal cortex produces hormones needed to regulate bodily functions such as our cardiovascular and anti-inflammatory functions. Adrenal medulla reduces adrenaline and noradrenaline that prepares our body for fight or flight. Our fight or flight response is a combination of the nervous system and the endocrine system working together. So for example, the hypothalamus, which is a part of our brain, is alerted to a stressful situa situation, which then activates the sympathetic nervous system of our nervous system.
which then causes the adrenal medulla, so that's our endocrine gland, to release adrenaline and noradrenaline ready for fight or flight. You need to be aware of what adrenaline can do. So adrenaline triggers a number of physiological changes to our body in response to fight or flight. So for example, increased heart rate, increased breathing, because we're gonna want to get more oxygen and blood flow to our muscles in order to either flee from the stressful situation or fight it head on. Our pupils will dilate, so they'll get bigger, so we want to see what is going to attack us. We stop producing saliva and our digestion inhibits because we want to spend energy on our muscles, our movement. We also need to be aware about neurons. So a neuron is the basic building block of the nervous system. And they're nerve cells that process and transmit messages through chemical and electrical signals. So each neuron has a very similar structure in that they have an axon which carries the impulses from the cell body down the length of the neuron. Okay, We have a cell body that contains all of our information. We have our dendrites that control the centre of the neuron. And then we have our axon, our terminal buttons at the end of the neuron, which means that we can um, send out neurotransmitters across the synapse. So you need to be aware about the three types. We have sensory neurons, which conduct information from our spinal cord. And generally they have quite long dendrites and a short axon. Relay neurons uh, connect, send information from our sensory neurons to our motor neurons. So remember like a relay race, they are passing the information along. They have short dendrites and can have a short or long axon. Motor neurons uh, conduct impulses that affect our muscles or glands and they have short dendrites and a long axon. So you also need to be aware about synaptic transmission. So this is the way information is passed down. So it's not as complex as it sounds. So neurons are neighbouring one another and it's how they send information to each other. So firstly it has to, the information is passed down originally as an electric impulse down our axon and it reaches the presynaptic terminal so it reaches the end. However the gap between the two neighbouring neurons is the synapse and the electric impulse cannot be transmitted. Okay, It has to be converted into a chemical impulse. So these chemicals are our neurotransmitters that are released and they're released from the synaptic vesicle. So these little sacs, they release the neurons, neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitter uh, moves into the synapse, that gap, and it's taken up by the next neuron, which then gets converted back into an electrical impulse and it travels down that ar uh, axon to the next neuron, where it gets converted into a chemical impulse, travels across the synapse again, and then gets converted, picked up, converted back into an electrical impulse. We need to be aware that neuro transmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory. So if it's got excitation, it increases the positive charge of the postsynaptic neuron. So it means it's more likely to fire. If it's inhibited, it increases the negative charge and it means the postsynaptic neuron is less likely to fire. These effects of excitatory and inhibitory are summed together, they're added together. And if the net effect is inhibitory, so there's more negative charges, then the postsynaptic neuron is less likely to fire. If the net effect is excitatory, so there's more, there's more of a positive charge, the postsynaptic neuron is more likely to fire.